Hi, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Wherever you find us, whether it's a video or podcast on your favorite platform, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. You can also find us on major social media platforms. If you go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com, you can find links to the videos or MP3 files, which you can download and enjoy without commercial interruptions. If you're into classic horror, ghost, and adventure stories, I narrate Nightshade Diary, and you can find links at nightshadediary.com. If scary stories are your bag, and listening to encounters with cryptids, ghosts, dogmen, and other weird creatures sends a shiver up your spine, then go to supernaturalstorytime.com for links to our weekly podcasts. Noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird can be found at eerie.news or visit the Stranger Than Fiction Stories tab at miamighostchronicles.com. Please subscribe to my newsletter on Substack. Just go to mppelliser.com for a link. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi, everybody. This is Marlene with Stories of the Supernatural. And this week... The only guest we'll have is me, myself, and I as we go into a very cold and unsolved historical mystery. We're going to title this Catherine's Curse and the Murder of Elma Sands. In 1799, a young woman named Julialma or Elma Sands was killed. Her reputation was shredded during her murder trial. However, no one was ever punished for the deed. Most of those surrounding the incident who perhaps cheated her of justice suffered a series of misfortunes in the years that followed. The first part is called the Manhattan Company Well Murder. The Manhattan Company supplied New York City with water. The company was owned by Aaron Burr. Among the wells sunk by the company was one in Lawrence Street, later renamed to South Fifth Avenue. It stood in an open field. A resident who lived close by was Elias Ring, a Quaker and well-to-do merchant who lived with his family in a mansion at 372 Pearl Street. The place was known as the Ring Boarding House. He resided there with his wife Catherine, two orphan nieces, one of them named Hope, the other Julema or Elma Sands. Now, Elma fell in love with one of the boarders. His name was Levi Hinckley Weeks. This was a a young gentleman who was staying there at her uncle's home. Now, on December 22, 1799, she told her Aunt Catherine and her sister Hope that she was leaving with Levi Weeks in order to get married. Her relatives were not surprised since they suspected a romance between the two young people. They approved of the match since Levi was a carpenter and his brother was a well-to-do builder. Later that night, Levi Weeks returned to the home asking where Alma was. Mrs. Ring was surprised because she understood that her niece had left with him. He swore he left Alma standing in the hallway and had gone out to pick up the sleigh at his brother's house. By morning, search parties went out to find Alma. A few days later, by a well, they found a muff she had borrowed from a neighbor. On January 2nd, 1800, 11 days after her disappearance, her uncle dragged the well and brought up the girl's body. Her dress was torn above the waist and her shawl and shoes were missing. On January 6th, the coroner's jury was assembled and gave a verdict of murder by some person or persons unknown. Public opinion was that Weeks was the killer. By January 10th, he was arrested on suspicion and he was arraigned. He pled not guilty. His brother, Ezra Weeks, a prominent contractor, who helped to construct the new waterworks stretching from Lisbonard's Meadow into the city, was determined to get him acquitted. The trial took place on March 31, 1800, in Federal Hall. The lawyers defending Levi Weeks was Aaron Burr, Alexander Hamilton, and Brockholst Livingston. The reason Weeks got some of the most prominent attorneys to represent his brother is that Burr and Hamilton were indebted to Ezra Weeks and worked on the case for free. Brockholst, who had plans in politics, was motivated to join this dream team since he feared he would lose a chance for recognition. 
By then, he had already lived a turbulent life. He survived an assassination attempt in 1785 and killed a man named James Jones in a duel in 1798. Livingston, who would go on to become a New York Supreme Court judge. Ironically, while collaborating on this case, Hamilton, in private correspondence, was writing bitter things against Burr. He was convinced that Burr was a dangerous man to society and to the country. Aaron Burr came from a well-connected family. His father co-founded Princeton. During the Revolutionary War, he achieved the rank of major. He met his future wife, Theodosia Prevost, when she opened the doors to her home in New Jersey to officers from the Continental Army. She was married then and had five children. She was 10 years older than Burr. However, they fell in love. When her husband, a British officer, died of yellow fever, they married in 1783. She gave birth to four children with Aaron Burr. However, only one survived. This was a daughter named Theodosia. Burr's wife died in 1794 at the age of 48. Now, let's get to the part about the trial. The People versus Levi Weeks. The case was spoken about constantly in the papers. It was the major point of gossip throughout New York City. Handbills appeared about a ghost being seen at Liz Bernard's Meadow, where the well was located. The spirit being the shade of Elma Sands, wet and pale, asking for her death to be avenged. Another rumor that swirled during the drama of the trial and afterward was that one of the associate counsel for the defense, known as a flagrant libertine, had been intimate with Elma Sands and had his own personal reason for securing Weeks' release. Who this libertine was remained unnamed. But chances are it was Aaron Burr who had a reputation as a womanizer. The prosecutor, Cadwalder D. Colden, who would go on to become mayor of New York, took the floor to establish a motive for the alleged crime. He called on witness after witness to testify that Levi and Elma were not only courting, but it was was generally believed headed toward marriage. Testimony was taken from those who lived in the household to confirm the girl was in good spirits, thus sending speculation that she took her life. Others testified that Weeks used his brother's sleigh on the evening when the murder was committed. Others said they heard screams of murder, help, near the area of the well around 9 o'clock that evening. Elma's corpse was found to have bruises and wounds about her head. A doctor found her collarbone was dislocated. She also had marks on her neck, as if they had been produced by violent pressure. The doctor commented he didn't think it was possible she could have inflicted this on herself. Aaron Burr, during the opening, spoke badly of the dead girl and praised the defendant. The defense attorneys also called in several witnesses that established the poor character of Elma Sands and that she was often melancholy and had more than once talked of ending her life. They had doctors testify that the girl had drowned and the bruising might have arisen after being in the water many days. They also confirmed she was not pregnant. The defense team also cast doubt on Elias Ring's testimony that he had heard passionate noises coming from Alma's room which adjoined his bedchamber. The attorneys brought in a blacksmith that shared a wall with the boarding house and this man said he overheard carnal encounters taking place in Alma's room and he swore it was Elias Ring's voice himself. He assumed Ring was having a tryst with Alma while his wife was away during a yellow fever outbreak in the summer of 1799. The blacksmith said that he commented to his wife that Ring had ruined the girl. Joseph Watkins, a boarder in the room adjacent to Sands, testified that her uncle, Elias Ring, entered and exited her bedroom at all hours of the night. Again, during those days, his wife Catherine was away from the house. There was contradictory testimony as to whether Elma was ever seen in the sleigh with Ezra Weeks. Different rumors swirled as to Alma's condition, whether she was happy or melancholy, was she pregnant or not. The tactic was to cast doubt on the motive Ezra Weeks would have to kill his own sweetheart, and whether Elma Sands jumped into the well, thus murdering herself. Another incident during the trial was when Burr or Hamilton, the story differs as to who did it, was said to have suddenly moved two candelabras 
close to the face of a border at the house so as to give him from where the jury sat a ghastly and livid look. He was a salesman named Richard D. Croucher who had a devilish aspect to his countenance and had smeared Levi's character in no uncertain terms insinuating that he had even happened upon Elma and him in flagrante delicto. During the trial, several witnesses declared they saw Levi spend the evening from 8 to 10 p.m. at his brother's house. The evidence that he borrowed the slave was weak, and on the third day the counsel suddenly closed the case without any address to the jury from either side. Judge John Ten Eck Lansing Somewhat annoyed at not having time to review the testimony, instructed the jury that there was not sufficient evidence to justify them bringing in a verdict of guilty. The jury retired and brought in a verdict of not guilty in less than 10 minutes. It was reported in the newspapers that Catherine Ring, who was Alma's aunt, said to Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr at the rendering of the verdict, quote, if thee dies a natural death, I shall think there is no justice in God. End quote. There was no other investigation into who killed Elma Sands and threw her into a well. The defense team kept insisting that Elma had committed suicide, so the search for her killer would be moot if she died by her own hand. However, she wouldn't be the first victim who was relegated to being a suicide, when in truth she was the victim of a murderer. It wouldn't be long before those who left her unavenged were visited by misfortune. On November 23, 1801, a year after Weeks' acquittal, Philip Hamilton, 19, met a young lawyer named George I. Aker, who he had challenged to a duel. A single bullet entered his body, and he never got a shot off. He was carried to his parents' home, where he died the following day. He was said to have been Hamilton's favorite child. In 1802, Hamilton and his wife Betsy welcomed an eighth child, which they named Philip in memory of his dead brother. It was said that Hamilton never overcame the sorrow of losing his son. George Ecker, though, was not long for this world either. He died in 1804 from consumption at the age of 29. For Aaron Burr, life was quite the opposite of Hamilton. A few months earlier, Burr's daughter Theodosia married Joseph Alston, who would go on to become governor of South Carolina. Burr was sworn in as vice president under Thomas Jefferson. In 1802, Burr's first grandson named Aaron Burr Alston was born. In the coming years, Theodosia claimed she had a hard time adjusting to the isolated life of a plantation mistress at the Oaks, the Alston family estate on the Waccamaw River in South Carolina, and was soon spending half the year in New York with her father. The problems between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton, both revolutionary war heroes, developed through their bids to different political offices. The last incident was when Burr ran for the governorship of New York and lost. He blamed Hamilton and challenged him to a duel. Unofficially, rumors swirled as to the real cause of the duel. Aaron had been incensed by a comment Hamilton had made about still more despicable acts. Some thought Hamilton may have been referring to Aaron and his daughter Theodosia's morbid affection for each other, which had led to whispers of incest. Burr and Hamilton agreed to meet in New Jersey on the morning of July 11, 1804, in a spot frequented to settle arguments with a duel. Hamilton's own son had been killed at this very spot three years before. When the duel took place, Burr was widowed and his daughter was married. Hamilton, on the other hand, was the head of a large family which depended solely on his earnings. Both men, though owning a large amount of land, were deeply in debt. Even though they had met to fight a duel when Burr killed Hamilton, the public was outraged. An indictment was issued against Burr, but the case never reached trial. He finished serving his term as vice president. However, his political aspirations were quashed. Then he headed west to establish a new country comprised of the Louisiana Purchase and Mexico, conspiring with James Wilkinson, Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Army and Governor of the Northern Louisiana Territory. Burr hatched the plot to conquer some of Louisiana and maybe even Mexico and crown himself Emperor. He also dragged in others who had funded the expedition. One was Harmon Blennerhassett, 
who was arrested and disgraced. In 1807, Burr was accused of treason. He snuck out of Natchez but was found and arrested in Alabama. The trial took place in Richmond, Virginia, and he was found not guilty. With the help of Theodosia, he smuggled himself out of the country and headed for Europe. His political career and his reputation was ruined. Now let's move on for just a moment to Levi Weeks, who had been accused of Elma Sand's murder, since we're talking here about curses and misfortunes. Levi Weeks was 24 when he was accused of the murder of Elma Sands. Even though he was acquitted, he was ostracized by the citizens of the city, and their hostility forced him to leave New York. By 1805, he made stops in Ohio and Kentucky before settling in Natchez. He married Anne Greenleaf on January 17, 1813. He was successful as an architect and builder, but he was not destined for old age since he died in 1819 when he was only 43 years old. Then let's move on to Judge John Lansing, who presided over the week's trial. On the evening of December 12, 1829, Chief Justice John Lansing, who presided over the week's trial, left a city hotel bound for Albany to post an important letter. A steamboat, which lay at the foot of Cedar Street, would transport the mail packets. Judge Lansing never returned from his errand and vanished without a trace. His disappearance was never explained. Some insisted he hanged himself in the garret of the city hall and that his friends buried him secretly. Others said he fell into the slip and was drowned. Many years later, a memoir of the newspaper publisher Thurlow Weed suggested that Lansing was murdered by political opponents. Another theory suggests that Lansing was murdered by a group of people who were opposed to his views on the Erie Canal, which connected the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes. Whatever the reason, Judge Lansing's body was never discovered, and much less who had been the perpetrator, if indeed he was murdered. Then we move on to Aaron Burr's daughter, Theodosia. With her father fleeing to Europe in a self-imposed exile, Theodosia's health, which was never good, deteriorated. It's believed she was suffering from uterine cancer. The trauma of the birth of her first and only child made it difficult to have intercourse, and there were no other children. In June 1812, Burr's beloved grandson, nicknamed Gampy, died of malaria. Amid the sorrow of losing their one child, Joseph Alston was elected as governor of South Carolina in December of 1812. America was on the brink of war with Britain, and Burr made inquiries to verify He would not be arrested if he returned to New York. His health was bad, he was penniless, and his only grandson had died. The murder charges against him were dropped, and he resumed practicing law. He wrote his daughter, asking her to join him in New York. With his new responsibilities and the War of 1812 underway, Joseph Alston could not accompany Theodosia to see her father. To make sure his grieving wife traveled safely, Alston asked his friend Dr. Timothy Green to accompany her. They left on December 31, 1812 on the Patriot, a small schooner accompanied by a French maid and a skeleton crew from Georgetown County. But by February 24, 1813, no word had reached either husband or her father, and Theodosia's whereabouts could not be determined. Despite his political success, Joseph Alston died a broken man in 1816, age 37. He never learned the fate of his wife. Rumors as to what happened to the Patriot and Theodosia abounded. Some thought that they had fallen prey to the British. Some believed that the ship had been captured by pirates who hunted prey in the waters of the Outer Banks. Through the years, several men, once pirates, made deathbed confessions about the fate of Theodosia Burr Alston. In one, the ship was scuttled with all on board. In another version, Theodosia was made to walk the plank, and ultimately that she committed suicide instead of submitting to a pirate captain named Octave Chauvet. Other stories were more far-fetched. One place, Theodosia in Texas, the wife of an Indian. 
In another, she was taken to Bermuda and became a pirate's mistress. Considering the state of her health, these were improbable. In 1813, Theodosia was lost at sea. Burr was never able to recapture his success as a lawyer or politician. And by 1830, only by the kindness of his friends was he able to support himself. Now we move on to a very interesting lady by the name of Eliza Jumel Burr. Burr's salvation arrived in the form of a wealthy widow, 20 years his junior, named Eliza Jumel. They married in 1833. He was 77 years old. Burr's reason for the marriage was obvious. He needed her wealth. He in turn gave her what she lacked, which was a connection to New York's upper crust. She was born Elizabeth Betsy Bowen in Rhode Island on April 2, 1775. Although there's dispute as to her actual year of birth being 1769 instead of 1775. Her mother Phoebe in her youth was an indentured servant and her father John Bowen was a sailor. When she was seven years old, Eliza was living in a brothel with her mother. Then in 1784, she and her sister Polly were sent to a workhouse. Soon the sisters were living with their mother and Patience Ingram, a widow cited for, quote, keeping a house of bad fame, end quote. In other words, a brothel. Her father drowned in 1786. In 1790, her mother married Jonathan Clark, an itinerant cobbler. They ended up in North Carolina and both died in 1798 from a yellow fever outbreak. Eliza went on to be indentured to a sea captain and his family. It's believed this man was Jacques de la Croix, who fathered her illegitimate child born in 1794. She became his mistress, and it's believed she even traveled to France with him. She named the boy George Washington Bowen and gave him to foster parents. She moved to New York City a few weeks later. Eliza, now 19, or maybe 23, changed her name to Eliza Brown. She worked in the theater and possibly as a domestic servant to keep food on the table. Etienne Jumel, who came from a wealthy French-Haitian merchant family, came to America in 1795 due to a slave insurrection in Haiti that drove him from the coffee plantation the family owned. During those years that Alma Sands was murdered and Burr shot Hamilton in a duel, Etienne and Eliza met, and he set her up as his mistress. Jumel amassed a fortune in the wine business. Not a year went by that a ship from Bordeaux arrived laden with brandy, wine, and dried goods from Monsieur Jumel. He lived with Eliza at a mansion at Whitehall and Pearl Streets, adjoining the house for stables and a shop. This was not far from the Ring boarding house. New York socialites opened their doors to Stephen Jumel, who had anglicized his first name, but not to Eliza, even after they married in 1804. In 1813, they moved to a 19-room mansion in Harlem Heights, built in 1765 by a Tory named Colonel Roger Morris. He had built the Palladian-style home and named it Mount Morris. The land originally belonged to Jacob Dickman, an early Dutch colonizer. Eliza Jumel told her husband that it was haunted, but this did not drive them from their home. And God knows that by the time the Jumels came to occupy that house, enough history had occurred beneath its roof that it might just have harbored a ghost or two. And this is the history of the mansion up until the time the Jumels moved in. As the Revolutionary War raged, Roger Morris, who was a royalist, took his family to his in-law's estate and left Mount Morris unoccupied. On September 15, 1776, General George Washington occupied the abandoned house with his officers and domestic staff after the Continental Army's retreat from Brooklyn. It served as his headquarter. It was then taken over by the British who quartered Hessian mercenaries there. During the Battle of Fort Washington, Continental prisoners were quartered in the barn. General Sir Henry Clinton kept his summer headquarters in the mansion in 1778, as did General Knipphausen in the following years. Baron Wilhelm von Knipphausen was the Hessian commander. In 1779, the estate was confiscated since Morris and his American wife were British loyalists. Mary Morris was one of only three women accused of treason in New York. It was sold by auction 
along with Morris's plate and furniture, to help offset the large war debt incurred by the Americans. In 1789, it became a tavern and a stagecoach named Calumet Hall on the old Albany Post Road. In July 1790, President Washington visited the house with some members of his future cabinet and noted the house as being in possession of a common farmer at that time. Then it was abandoned and the surrounding acreage was used by tenant farmers. In 1809, John Jacob Astor bought out the interest of the Morris descendants and sued to get back rents from everyone who had farmed the land. He was successful in winning over $500,000. When the Jumals purchased the mansion from Astor, they renovated and redecorated after many years of neglect. They planted vineyards of Bordeaux grapes that still run wild today in neighboring Highbridge Park. The Jumals traveled to Paris in 1815. With them traveled Mary Jones, Eliza's illegitimate niece that they called Mary Eliza. They gave her the surname of Jumal, and she lived with them like a daughter. They were accepted by the French aristocracy and became known as sympathizers for Napoleon Bonaparte. Rumors were that someone whispered in Stephen's ear about Madame Eliza's scandalous past that he was not privy to. Whether this was accurate or not, she returned to New York in 1816 with Mary Eliza, but without her husband. Five years passed before she returned to France and Stephen. However, by then, the Paris branch of the business was faltering. In 1826, he sent her back to New York with a power of attorney and instructions to sell the property there and send them the money. She executed the sale but kept the money. Two years later, Stephen came to New York after the business collapsed in France. He fell from a hay cart and died on May 22, 1832. By the time of her husband's death, Eliza, due to her sharp business acumen, had become one of the wealthiest women in New York City. During those years she traveled to Europe, she amassed a large art collection. She also traveled to Saratoga Springs and bought over 200 acres of land. She built a house there named the Tuileries. However, despite her success in becoming a rich woman, the one thing that escaped her and which she wanted desperately was to be accepted by New York's elite families. Fourteen months after she became a widow, Eliza married Aaron Burr. It did not take her long to realize she was the only one with business acumen, and if she left her finances in Burr's hands, he would squander it away in short order. She named Alexander Hamilton Jr. as her attorney to handle the divorce. By then, Burr had been stricken with a series of strokes which left him paralyzed, and a cousin cared for him. Divorce was not easy to acquire in those years, especially when the husband is set against it. But like in all other things, Eliza got what she wanted. The divorce was granted on September 14, 1836, the day Aaron Burr died at the age of 80. However, she chose to be identified as Aaron Burr's widow, which she technically was, in a way. Some historians believe that Burr sired other illegitimate children, but for all intents and purposes, his desire to leave a legacy through his daughter and heirs came to nothing. In those times, the legitimacy of your offspring was very important. Eliza Jumel died at the age of 90 in 1865, outliving her niece Eliza Jumel Chase. She left much of her large estate that was estimated to be about $1 million to a local church and other charities, to the surprise of her relatives who had expected a more generous inheritance. They spent 17 years fighting Eliza's will. Among them was George Washington Bowen, her illegitimate son, who sued Nelson Chase, Mary Eliza's widower, who sought to claim the inheritance. Nelson Chase had acted as Eliza Jumel's attorney for many of her business transactions. An interesting piece of testimony came from Anne Vandervoot, 65, born in Providence, Rhode Island, who said she received from her mother, who was Eliza Jumel's sister, an old book with an inscription on the flyleaf that read, Quote, George Washington Bowen, born of Eliza Bowen, at my house in town Providence, Rhode Island, October 9, 1794, signed Reuben Ballou. Now this was testimony given during one of the many trials trying to find out who were the legitimate heirs of Eliza Jumel. 
Now, Ruben Ballou was a young major in the Revolutionary Army and used to carry dispatches. His wife was a midwife who seems assisted at the birth of Eliza's son. During this time, Ballou was thrown from his horse and was visited several times by General George Washington. It was then that the rumors circulated that George Washington Bowen's father was General Washington. Later, Anne Vandervoort admitted that naming George Washington as Bowen's father started out only as a joke. This admission killed Bowen's lawsuit for his mother's inheritance. The winners of this long court battle was Nelson Chase. Even though the drawn-out court proceedings ate up much of the settlement, they sold the property in 1887. French photographer Louis Le Prince and his family took up residence in 1889. The prince mysteriously disappeared in 1890, and what happened to him has never come to light. From 1894 to 1903, General Ferdinand Earle and his wife Lily, with their children, lived at the Jumel Mansion. However, they called the estate Earl Cliff. He was related to the original Morris family through his mother, Elizabeth Earl Nipinney. Lily Earle headed the Washington Heights Society of the Children of the American Revolution. She hosted several events at the mansion, including meetings of the Sons of the American Revolution, which General Earl belonged to. After General Earl's death, Lily sold the house and two surrounding acres to the Daughters of the American Revolution, who in turn asked the city of New York to step in and assist in the restoration of the only pre-revolutionary house still left and where the Battle of Harlem Heights took place. The structure faced demolition. They took it over, more than likely because Washington had headquartered there for about three weeks. It became the Morris Jumel Mansion Museum in 1904. The first public celebration of Washington's birthday by the city of New York was held there in 1905. Now we come to the haunting of the Jumel Mansion. Occasionally visitors to the museum would report meeting a lady that fit the description of Eliza Jumel. Another phantom was a Hessian soldier said to have died on the stairs. A third restless spirit was a maid who had jumped out a window. The curators were not happy with this and ignored all the stories. Instead, they focused on the few weeks General Washington had stayed there. In 1964, Hans Holzer visited the mansion twice with psychic Ethel Myers. Supposedly, they contacted Stephen Jumel, who said he was murdered by Eliza, which contradicts a review of the letters sent between the couple when he lived in France and she was in New York, in which they appeared to be fond of each other. The story of the children's encounter was the following, quote, January 19, 1964, a small group of school-aged children had arrived early to see the tour of the mansion. As they waited to be let in, they became restless. Then they saw on the balcony above them a lady in a flimsy purple gown, who told them, shush, in an effort to quiet and calm them down. Then she went right through the closed doors of the room behind the balcony. When the curator, Mrs. C., arrived to let them in, they asked her why the lady in the balcony didn't open up the building. There wasn't any lady in the balcony, and all then realized it was a ghost that had been seen. Mrs. C. realized then that the mansion was haunted. The lady that was seen on the balcony was believed to be Madame Jamal herself, as she fit the description. And now we move on to Theodosia's fate. Remember? Theodosia Burr Alston, who had gone missing after a ship was lost, supposedly, at sea. Now, in 1866, Dr. William Gaskins Pool, about 50 acres bordering on the ocean, at or near Nags Head. This is North Carolina. He lived in Elizabeth City, but vacationed at Nags Head, and perhaps it was Theodosia's spirit that in 1869 steered him to the cottage of an ailing woman named Polly Mann. His daughter Anna accompanied him to the home on Bald Head Island, North Carolina. Amid the murkiness of the interior, both of them were surprised by the portrait of a beautiful young woman about 25 years of age. Polly told him her father, Joseph Toller, had been a wrecker who scavenged ships that washed up on the Outer Banks. He, along with some other men, came upon a scuttled, empty schooner near Kitty Hawk during the War of 1812. In one of the cabins, they found luxurious items and dresses. 
One of the items was the portrait. Perhaps Polly's father was one of those that were known to walk a donkey with a lantern on its neck on the shore of the island during stormy weather. The bobbing light would lure vessels into the sandbars where it would become stuck. The men on shore would swarm the ship, plunder the goods, and leave no witnesses behind. Supposedly, Dr. Poole took the portrait as payment for his service. He already suspected who the subject in the painting was. The 18 by 12 inch painting was unsigned, but it is believed to be the work of John Vangelin. Dr. Poole contacted Theodosia's family members who believed it might be her, but none of them had met her. Only her sister-in-law, Mary Alston Pringle, had met Theodosia and she could not confirm it was her. The portrait is now at Yale University's Lewis Walpole Library. In later years, there have been reports of a semi-transparent woman walking along the shoreline on Bald Head Island. She's wearing a long white dress and has never spoken to anyone. Some believe this is Theodosia's ghost still stuck in 1813. Now let's return back to the murder trial of Alma Sands. And there was a boarder at the ring house. His name was Richard D. Croucher. Was he the real culprit? Richard Croucher was 40 years old during that trial. This was the man that either Aaron Burr or Hamilton had taken the con delabra and shone it on his face because they had heard that Levi Weeks had been maligned very badly by Croucher far and wide. Basically, Croucher had accused Weeks of being the murderer of Alma Sands. And many believe they created prejudice against Weeks before the trial. Now, this same man, Richard Croucher, was accused of rape in July 1800 of his stepdaughter. He had just married the girl's foster mother, Mrs. Stackhalvers, in April 1800. This was only three months after the murder of Alma Sands. Margaret Miller, age 13, testified the following, quote, Mr. Croucher came to my mother, Mrs. Stackhalvers, I don't know how long ago to sell some stockings. He used to come every day. One night, he asked my mama if she would let me go and scrub his room for him at Mr. Ring's where he lived, for he said there was a lady and gentleman coming to look at some linens he had. She said at first that she did not know whether I might or not, but at last she consented. He said he wanted me to go that night so that I might be there very early in the morning and that I might sleep with a servant girl in the house if I would go. So I went with him to Mr. Ring's house and Greenwich Street, almost by Rhinelander's brew house. He told me to go upstairs to a room in the third story and he would follow. It was about nine o'clock. I heard the clock strike eight some time before. I went up and he followed and took me through a dark entry into a room in the third story. He told me the servant girl would come and sleep with me and then he locked the door and took out the key and went down. After a little time he came back and locked the door inside. Then he took me and undressed me and put me on the bed and then he undressed himself and came to bed with me. Here the witness burst into tears and was unable to proceed but being told it was absolutely necessary she should tell what followed she said he used force he did what he would and hurt me very much so much that I could hardly get home the next morning after he had done he fell asleep and I got up and sat upon some wood till I could see so as to find the door End quote. Croucher was found guilty of rape and sentenced to the state prison for life after already he was pardoned by newly elected Governor Clinton to relieve him of the embarrassment of too much regulation. The condition of his pardon was that he would leave the county. However, by 1803, he'd made his way to Virginia and had, according to a local newspaper, become a man of considerable standing in society. However, that was short-lived because in July 1803, he stole a great number of cases and packages of dry goods consigned to William Matthews besides a considerable amount in money. According to the book Duel with the Devil, the author found that Croucher, while living in England, tried to kill someone after having a psychotic break, thus earning him the moniker of Mad Croucher. The book describes that after his debacle in Virginia, 
he returned to London. Supposedly, Alexander Hamilton's son reported that he was executed for some heinous crime. Was Richard Croucher the real murderer of Elma Sands? Or did the rings unknowingly harbor two monsters under their roof, each vying for the same victim? Now, let's go on to the Manhattan Well. The well where Alma's body was discovered lay situated in a meadow. By the 1820s, the fields were covered by row houses. It was inevitable that one of the structures would be built over the well. As the years passed, the murder of Alma Sands faded as all those who lived during those years died themselves. The area became known as Soho. In 1840, a few doors down from where the well lay hidden, at 119, Mrs. Mott, the celebrated female physician of New York, advertised she had just received a large quantity of herbs, roots, and essential oils from Europe. In 1850, a dry goods shop was doing business from 115 Spring Street. They specialized in shawls. On April 18, 1869, the New York Times reported that the Manhattan Well, where Alma Sands' body was found in 1800, had been discovered. It was found inside a home at 115 Spring Street. The occupants had been digging a flower garden when they found it. It was covered with large flat stones. As time passed, the location of this horrific murder had been forgotten again. By the 1870s, the neighborhood was populated by whorehouses and not even high-end ones. Half a block from the well, Hattie Taylor ran a third-rate brothel that allowed only the lowliest clients through the front door. In 1877, a three-year-old boy named Thomas Phillips, who lived at the house, was bitten by a dog. The wound healed, but eventually went into convulsions and it was determined the animal that bit him had been rabid. During the Depression, the area became known as Hell's Hundred Acres. Perhaps it was then that the building was renumbered to 129 Spring Street. In the 1950s, the Manhattan Bistro opened at 129 Spring Street. The owners had heard of the ghost stories, but they never connected it to cold spots in the building or silverware that disappeared. During the early 1900s, the cellar had been filled with sand and dirt, but in 1980, they decided to excavate the area. They found the well and an increase in the paranormal occurrences to go with it. There were reports of voices and dishes moving by themselves. There were reports of a swirling mist around the well. Also a full-bodying apparition of Elma Sands weeping next to the well had been sighted. The Manhattan Bistro closed in 2014. COS clothing store opened in the space and there are still reports of missing items. Is Elma Sands to blame for all those paranormal occurrences? Who knows? But let's go back to right after Aaron Burr was disgraced for killing Hamilton in a duel. And he's no longer vice president, but still an important man. And he goes to West Virginia, what was known as a Virginia Terrace, to visit a family by the name of Blenner Hassett's. And it just turns out that this family was cursed as well. And this is their story. Now, can a place be tainted by the misdeeds of those that live there? Can the land remember even when they have all gone to their graves? The curse of the Blennerhassets came about due to the action of Harmon Blennerhassett Sr. He was born in 1764, the son of Conway and Elizabeth Blennerhassett in England. However, in 1766, the family returned to Castle Conway, the family estate in County Kerry. He was the youngest of three sons and six daughters, and he went on to study the law. Harmon inherited the family estate in 1792. He joined the Society of United Irishmen, which evolved into a militant radical group. In 1794, when he was 30 years old, he was sent to pick up his niece, Margaret Agnew, at her boarding school. She was the daughter of Major Robert Agnew, governor of the Isle of Man, Ireland, and his sister Catherine. Instead of returning the girl to her family, he ran off with her and they married. The scandal was so great, the couple had to flee Ireland two years later and went to America. 
he sold his estate in Ireland to his cousin, Lord Ventry. However, there is one problem with this version of what happened. In 1794, Margaret was 23 years old and not a schoolgirl. Whatever the circumstances of how this illicit relationship blossomed, it ended in an illegal marriage, since a union between an uncle and niece was considered incest. A record for the nuptials has never been found. Margaret, as a consequence, was disinherited by her family. The couple bought a 174-acre tract of land on an island on the Ohio River, one and a half miles downstream from what is present-day Parkersburg, West Virginia. This land once belonged to George Washington, but was thereafter known as Blennerhassett Island. They built a 7,000-square-foot sumptuous residence that was completed in 1800. 1800. This is the same time, the same year that Alma Sands was murdered, and there's a trial going on in New York City trying to establish if Levi Weeks was the person responsible for that crime. Now, the couple adopted their first child named Dominic, born in 1799. He was the son of a French doctor and the grandson of Elijah Bacchus, who sold them the land on the Ohio River. In 1801, they had a daughter named Margaret, who died in 1803, the same year they had their son Harmon Jr. He would become a lawyer, but ended his days as an invalid, being looked after by his mother. He died at age 50 in a poorhouse after his mother passed away. Description of Harmon Jr. included the word intemperate, which was a euphemism for alcoholism. Another daughter was born, also named Margaret, who died when she was six years old. The youngest son, Joseph Lewis, born in 1812 in a plantation the family owned in Missouri, went on to become a teacher, lawyer, and accomplished scholar. However, before misfortune came knocking at their door, the couple lived a lavish lifestyle and invited the gentry of the area to their extravagant parties. Among the visitors was one time Vice President Aaron Burr and his daughter Theodosia Burr Alston and her husband. Burr sought financial support from the wealthy landowners in the area and Blenner Hassett go on to lend him $5,000. The estate became the headquarters for Burr's 1806-1807 expedition to the southwest in a scheme to separate the Louisiana Territory from the American Union with the aid of the British. President Thomas Jefferson thought they were trying to take over the country. Burr and Blennerhassett were arrested along with their followers. The local Virginia militia occupied the estate in December 1806 and Margaret Blennerhassett had to flee with her children. Blennerhassett fled, was arrested twice, and ended up in the Virginia State Penitentiary. He was released after Burr was acquitted in 1807 for treason. The Blennerhassetts never returned to the estate, and it was destroyed by fire in 1811. It was held by Robert Miller in lieu of debts owed by Blennerhassett. Harmon Blennerhassett was not done with politics, though, and on October 30, 1807, he met Burr, Luther Martin, and others in Baltimore, where they narrowly escaped mob violence. He had to hide in the attic of the hotel where he was staying since he heard the mob meant to tar and feather him. He returned to Natchez in February 1808 where his family waited for him. The couple settled in the Mississippi Territory on a 1,000-acre cotton plantation they named La Cache, situated on the outskirts of Washington City near Chubby's Creek Fork of Bayou Pierre. Blennerhassett lost what was left of his fortune due to the War of 1812 embargo on cotton. It was during their time there that their second daughter, Margaret, was born and passed away. During those years, Blenner Hassett supervised the construction of a stockade as protection from the Indians. He also had troubles with some neighbors. Rumors were that he shot one and threatened another with an axe. Another time they were accused of beating a neighbor into insensibility. They... Harmon and his adopted son Dominic were arrested and fined a thousand dollars after being found guilty and serving a short jail term. In eighteen sixteen, the ruined mansion and lands on Blennerhassett Island were sold to Joseph L. Lewis for ten thousand dollars. Outstanding debts were subtracted from the sum, and barely five thousand dollars made it to Harmon Blennerhassett. Another rumor that circulated involved Margaret Blennerhassett, and in which it was said 
she could drink as much as any man, and that she had once danced at a tavern which, whether true or not, disgraced her socially. After living 12 years on the cotton plantation in Missouri, the couple sold it in 1819 and left for Canada so he could practice law. In 1822, he returned to England, leaving Margaret and their children in Montreal. He had been promised to be made a judge through the favor of the Duke of Richmond, then governor of Lower Canada. But the Duke died unexpectedly. Luckily, his sister, Avi Splenerhassett, settled her fortune on him. Margaret and the children joined the family in Europe in 1825, but for three years she endured hardships due to lack of money. The family lived with Avis near the city of Bath. Then they moved to the island of Jersey on the coast of France for the climate. It was a strange household, made up of Blennerhassett, Margaret, his wife, and Harmon's mistress named Mary Nelburn. This is how it was described, quote, Number one is on the Mount Row, Prince Albert's Road corner, and has a pillar box set in its front wall and garden. With the Blennerhassetts lived with his sister Abbess, his mistress, Mrs. Mary Nelburn, a milliner, in St. Peter Port, and her child, probably his too, also named Avis. He had practically nothing left, but Mrs. Nelburn had some money, and she kept them all. He appointed Mrs. Nelburn executrix of his will and expressed his warm appreciation for her financial generosity. He also expressed the hope that the three women, his wife, sister, and mistress, would continue to live together, and he shared his few possessions between them. What became of the others and the child Avis is not known. End quote. Eventually, Blennerhassett left to the island of Guernsey, where he died in 1831, giving instructions for a common burial to be carried out at night. Once marked by a tombstone, the location of his grave is unknown. In 1827, it was mentioned that Dominic Blennerhassett was living in Natchez and was observed to be in a state of great derangement in consequence of his excessive intemperance. Nothing further was heard from him after 1828, and the circumstances of his life and death remain unknown. Some believe his final resting place was in the Mississippi River. In 1842, Margaret and her son, Harmon Blanner Hassett Jr., returned to the United States and petitioned Congress for restitution for the destruction of their mansion. Joseph Lewis Blenner Hassett, who had taught in Ireland and Wales, returned with them to help his mother in her petition to the government. Margaret and Harmon Jr., who was an invalid, lived in a tenement in New York. Before she was granted compensation, she died on June 16, 1842, in a poorhouse in New York City, and was buried in the New York vault of their family friend Robert Emmett, located at St. Paul's at Broadway. Her son Harmon followed her to the grave in 1854 and was buried in the same location. In 1862, Harmon Blanner has its last surviving son, Joseph Lewis, died. But in a strange twist, his son Edward Blanner Hassett, who lived in St. Louis, was involved in treasonous activity in 1861. He, along with a gang of 16 persons, were arrested opposite the arsenal. They were suspected of trying to recruit for the rebel army. It wasn't until 1901 that the true relationship between Harmon Blenner Hassett and Margaret Agnew came to light to the world at large. No doubt the families kept the secret of the incestuous union very quiet. The state of West Virginia reconstructed the Blenner Hassett mansion in 1984 on its original foundation, which is presently the site of a state park. In 1996, the bodies of Margaret and Harmon Jr were reburied on the island in a historical Episcopalian ceremony. Despite having lived less than 10 years on Blennerhassett Island, the family is said to haunt the land. One of the stories concerned the burial of two-year-old Margaret laid to rest before her family fled. The grave site became abandoned and the marker was washed away when the island flooded. One legend claims two farmers, while plowing a field near where the mansion once stood, unearthed a tiny skeleton which they reburied in an unmarked grave. The location till this day is unknown. In the early 70s, either an archaeologist or a surveyor was camping near the old summer kitchen. That night, he saw a tall lady come towards him, which was unusual since no boats were running at this time. The lady didn't say a word, but walked around as if she were looking for something. 
he ran for his tent and didn't come out until the sun came up. The description fit Margaret Blennerhassett. It seems her ghost is spotted all over the island, sometimes with a book in her hand. Another story involves campers who heard rustling outside their tent, and when they peeked out they saw a tall lady reading some of the books they had brought with them. There are also stories of horses behaving erratically when brought to the island, and a ghost child seen only by children. Minnie Kendall Lowther, in her 1939 book, Blenner Hassett Island in Romance and Tragedy, noted the following, quote, As we already know, Harmon Blenner Hassett and his wife wandered and suffered until they found graves divided by the tossing deep. Their children, blighted by dissipation, were a sad disappointment, and their descendants were entirely wiped out early in the second generation. Theodosia Burr and Margaret Blenner Hassett were equally favored with the advantages of birth, wealth, and education. Everything we spoke promise and happiness. None could have believed that such an awful night was in store for the idolized Theodosia. But the fate of Margaret Blenner Hassett was worse. It is another impressive reminder of the vanity, the uncertainty of all human hopes. So there we go. Two very wealthy and powerful families who for some reason seem to be cursed and even their descendants eventually became totally wiped out. Thank you for being part of my audience. I will see you next week.